Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. This is Heather Mehdi and this is Voice of Free Pakistan. For Pakistanis living inside and outside Pakistan, this program is in English. This is a weekly roundup of uh, Pakistani and regional affairs. And uh, today uh, we have a special guest other than our regular guest, Dr. Zafar Bangish. Welcome to the program. And our special guest is Mr. Murtza Hussain from The Intercept. Just a quick introduction of the gentleman. Uh, Dr. Zafar Bangish is the director of the Institute of Islamic Contemporary Thought. He's also a very renowned author. He's written a wonderful book on the power manifestations of, of, uh, the, of the Prophet's writings and his, and his contract with foreign government. Uh, he was also the founder editor of The Crescent. Uh, welcome to the program, Dr. Zafar Bagish. Thank you very much, uh, Heather, and also to Murtaza. Assalamu alaikum to both of you and to your viewers. Wa alaikum as uh, Murta is a is a very now a very known name in Pakistan. He's the national security correspondent for the Intercept. Uh, the Intercept has played a sterling role in exposing some really massive uh, stories related to Pakistan, especially uh, the cipher case in which uh, the entire contents of the so-called cipher or the cipher that was given by the Pakistani ambassador to Pakistan. They've also exposed some other things. Uh, uh, Murza and Ryan Grimm are what I call pebbles in the in the shoes of even the American State Department. Ryan Grimm, uh, their, their correspondents who attends the daily briefings of the State Department spokesperson really uh, throws some serious curveballs at the spokesperson. So welcome to the program, Murtaza. Thank you for having me again. My pleasure, sir. Uh, Dr. Bankit and uh, Murtaza Sahab, we will like to start from something closer to home. Uh, Murtaza, you had it, uh, tweeted a little a couple of days ago on the statement by the Pakistani army chief Asim Munir and we hit in which he pretty much uh, you know abused uh, that country and and uh, your tweet says when it comes to the safety and security of every single Pakistani the whole of Pakistan can be damned and this type of polarizing commentary is not going to endear him to our funds uh, Murtz, I'll start with you. Your views on this, please. Yeah, so uh, the Pakistani army chief gave a very high-profile speech. At a, I believe it was a graduation ceremony or some gathering of uh, young army personnel. Stu students. There were students gathered in the convention center. He was trying to do what is called a warm outreach to students. I see, I see. Uh, so I, I read the text of the speech, and yeah, there were some very interesting comments. Uh, I think this was one of the most interesting in the sense that it's kind of a hostile comment towards Afghans, or you know, dismissive comments towards Afghans. And you know, of course, uh, Afghanistan is a bordering country of Pakistan. They have to have good relations with them on some sense, and you know, it's can you can probably notice from reading the news or just reading commentary from Afghans themselves. A lot of them are quite unhappy with uh, Pakistan's policy towards their country over the last couple of years, which in their view, they feel has uh, helped promote, you know, the weakening of their sovereignty or the rise of the Taliban in that country. And Pakistanis will say, well, this was something which is in their national interest, had to be done and so forth. But, you know, at the same time, it's not a conflict between the two peoples of these countries. It's a conflict between governments that's been taking place. But I think that uh, this comment, you know, it's very dismissive of the concerns of Afghans. And maybe, you know, to a Pakistani audience, it's his job to care about security of Pakistanis. That's fine. But you don't want to cause or exacerbate a conflict with a neighboring country with which you have significant cultural and religious ties and so forth. So I thought it was interesting. I think this is just how army guys tend to talk. They're much more blunt, maybe, than... Uh, civilian politicians in most countries at least uh but i think that to the extent this con this comment would be shared among afghans which i think it is being shared it'll certainly contribute to a negative perception of uh, pakistan and pakistanis which will have negative uh you know implications for pakistan's diplomatic and security standing as well dr Bagish. First of all, I think it was extremely inappropriate for the Pakistan army chief to make such uh, statements and declarations because uh, 
it is important to keep in mind that um, Pakistan uh, has uh, spoiled its relations with all of its neighbors. India is a traditional enemy. There is no chance in hell that um, relations are going to be improved with India in the near future or even in the distant future, because there are certain very fundamental differences between the two countries. Uh, uh, and, and in any case, uh, Pakistan is not now in a position to take on India militarily. And then you go to the north, which is China, uh, at the behest of the U.S., Pakistan has actually spoiled its relations with China as well. This will work to the detriment of Pakistan and to its economy. When you look at the Western borders, uh, Afghanistan and Iran, uh, you know, uh, Afghanistan, uh, according to army thinking, was supposed to be Pakistan's strategic depth. And now Pakistan has, since the Taliban drew out the, uh, threw the Americans out of there, uh, all of a sudden, relations have soured between the two countries. And the statements that um, uh, the army chief has issued is uh, completely uncalled for, simply because he should not be making the foreign policy of Pakistan. That's the uh, domain of the foreign office or the foreign ministry in Pakistan. The tragedy of Pakistan is that the military has uh, intruded into every policy matter, whether it's, uh, of course, security, they consider to be their own domain, but foreign policy, economic, uh, social, political, they are involved in social engineering. And these comments that he made, that he made were very, very, um, you know, problematic. Uh, and I'm sure if one were to be able to reach out to uh, the senior officials in the foreign office, that they would have a very different take on it if they were honest about it. It is not in the interest of Pakistan to take on so many countries all of uh, at the same time. Even if, let's say, there are major differences between Pakistan and Afghanistan, which I don't think there are, and with Iran as well, which, of course, both countries say that it's a br brotherly country, and yet Pakistan is constantly trying to uh, spoil its relations uh, with Iran as well. And this is not in the interest of Pakistan at all. Hmm. So you know this is uh, really interesting when when Murtaza posted this I I actually called up a couple of my uh, friends in in the army uh, I know many people who under whom he had served uh, I know a lot of people who he had served with his colleagues his course mates his people he had attended courses with and I've also known people under who he has commanded and I uh, had a uh, had a view about this gentleman and I then again uh, you know wanted to reinforce and I wanted to make sure that I had the right information before uh, unleashing so I, I just wanted to share what my uh, information was and I was responding to Mars is uh, Mutaza's view, and I said, I said this man is completely unbalanced. He's a loose cannon. He has huge issues with anger management. His course mates call him psychotic. This is an authentic statement from people, not one, several. Officers who have served under him, spoken to me directly, have called him a liar. He's crazy and he's unbalanced. I'm using exact quotes from what they told me. Some were in Urdu. I've translated them into English. People under whom he served, and I have spoken to several, said he's highly deceitful. He's a bootlicker, a hypocrite, will go to any level to suck up to his boss. And this guy has his hand on Pakistan's nuclear button. This is really scary. And I can now, you know, we can now understand why he would say something so intemperate in, in the, publicly. Any comment before we move towards the regional reasons? What does it? Well, it's very troubling. And uh, he said something else in that speech, which was interesting, uh, which some other people had highlighted as well, too. He said, uh, I think commenting on some of the recent negative press coverage of Pakistan in the foreign press, he said that, uh, you know, anyone can get a story published in an outlet like The Economist or The Guardian if they pay $500,000, which is just not true, actually. It's not uh, for all the issues that do exist in the press. Uh, it's not a pay-to-play system in the way he's describing it. But I think that he's rebutting, uh, you know, Imran Khan published an op-ed in The Economist mm. a few weeks ago, 
And there's been other coverage in other outlets too, which has been very critical of the current political situation in Pakistan. So it's a little disappointing because obviously if you're the leader of a country or de facto leader of a country, which maybe constitutionally shouldn't be, but it is the case, you want to uh, manage your relations with your own people and with your neighbors, with the international community. Uh, you don't want to develop a feeling or a sense of besiegement or paranoia or hostility towards the rest of the world, which, you know, other countries have. North Korea has that, and to some degree, Iran has that as well, too. It's not really conducive to, you know, navigating those relationships or inculcating a healthy attitude in the populace. So, you know, I think that to uh, spread the belief that everything in the foreign press is fake and it's all paid for, you know, it goes beyond reasonable criticism. It's sort of uh, it's breeding paranoia. Which I think would not be good for Pakistan. Dr. Bagesh? Yes, well, you see, uh, I, I read uh, his uh, outbursts uh, in the following context. Uh, you know, since Imran Khan's government was overthrown on April 9, 2022, uh, the military high command thought that uh, Imran Khan would be forgotten by the people. He would not be able to mobilize the people because that's what had happened in the past that the whenever the army threw out some some politician a prime minister whatever uh, he was soon forgotten by the people but in case of imran khan it turned out not to be the case because imran khan is extremely popular with the people he has mobilized the people he has created awareness among them in particular the youth in pakistan and that's why asim munir actually addressed the youth, the students, there are two and a half thousand students in that auditorium. And uh, he basically wanted all of the, uh, the attempts that the army high command had made against Imran Khan. Almost everything has failed. They tried to tarnish his image. They tried to sort of, you know, what is referred to as a Tosha Khana case that he sold gifts, etc., and didn't declare them properly. The Cypher case. I mean, there are 180 cases against Imran Khan. It's absolutely ridiculous that the man who had not a single case against him prior to you know being removed as prime minister suddenly he's now guilty of 180 uh, you know various sort of ridiculous charges this man made these statements because he sees that the army has lost the respect of the people in pakistan so now he was sort of you know hitting back you know, expanding his chest and thumping his chest that we'll, you know, we can fix Iran and we can fix Afghanistan and we can, you know, deal with India, this and that, all this kind of nonsense. This is the bravado that these people indulge in. But when it comes to actual situation, uh, you know, unfortunately, they are simply not capable of doing anything of that. And, sort. and, and, and it's really, uh, it's really scary that a man with this kind of uh, emotional uh, I, I don't know if he's psychotic. I mean, I'm not a clinical psychologist. But every time you hear him speak or or you uh, to third party, you know, you find this guy is completely out of control. So it's really dangerous for the world, including the region, uh, yeah. that you, you've got a guy like him with the finger on, on the nuclear button. He's commanding the seven, you know, 750,000 people with armed guns, you know. Who knows what this idiot and loony may do, uh, you know, to unleash a God knows what. Yeah, that's really scary. So if you look at if you look at the the um, uh, tra trajectory of Pakistan's politics and the, the kinds of statements and actions that this man has taken, uh, of course, this was, I think, the, the first uh, major sort of, you know, speech that the that he gave, because prior to that, he was you know, out of the yeah, picture. Yeah. So he wasn't publicly available. Yes. yes. He was actually, you know, operating from behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why he has had to come in public is because, as I mentioned, that yes. the yeah. army has not been able to yes. tarnish yeah. Imran Khan's image. It has not been able to, yes. uh, it has lost a lot of support among the masses. And so that's what he was trying to Thank do. You. To Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Murza, any last comments on this before we move forward? I have a... Uh, uh, to the next uh, topic, and I actually want to stick to Pakistan because uh, uh, you've actually tweeted uh, on the, what has happened in Balochistan when Maharang Baloch, uh, 
return. And you retweeted uh, Omar Farouk's uh, tweet, and I'm just going to read. It says, the tweet says, decades of protest by families looking for loved ones forcibly disappeared in Pakistan have morphed into a massive, unprecedented protest led by Maharang Baloch. And this is the Balochistan post, and this shows incredible scenes of uh, uh, welcome to... So this is a, this is an unprecedented uh, outpouring of genuine people's uh, voices against, uh, and they're openly saying that behind all this terrorism is the army. Murza, why did you why did you pour, uh, prostate? It must have hit you really hard, right? Uh, well, you know, Omar Farouk, the journalist who shared that, he's a friend of mine. So he's covered Balochistan for many years, hmm. and he has some level of expertise. And so I, I trust his perception of it. And I think that we were discussing recently these uh, reciprocal airstrikes between Pakistan and Iran, hmm. which seems like they're basically targeting Baloch people on both sides of the border. Uh, I think it's kind of unfortunate because obviously, you know, Balochistan is an important part of Pakistan. It's part of national sovereignty of Pakistan, includes many Baloch people and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of unsatisfaction with the, the situation there. And I think that, you know, it's very often that when you have a certain part of the country, any country where normal rules and laws are not applied, or there's inconsistency with laws, or the military is very involved in direct governance and uh, to the exclusion of any civilian civil society and so forth, which sometimes is simply crushed by the military. Uh, that template winds up being applied to the rest of the country as well, too. So I think that what you're seeing now is the Balochistanization of Pakistan. And what I mean by that is that you know, you're seeing the same rules which have applied in Balochistan for quite some time uh, apply to other parts of Pakistan. Maybe if a journalist you don't like, you can disappear them or a politician and so forth. You know, Pakistan, for all its problems over the years, has had a relatively robust civil society, very resilient civil society, I would say. And is that going to be the case in the future? I don't know. But uh, if it's not, then you already have an example of how Pakistan could also be governed. It could be governed the way Balochistan is governed. Wow. And, you know, there's, there's insurgencies in Balochistan as well, too. And those are supported. They don't want to be supported by countries which are hostile to Pakistan. But I don't think that, you know, India, for instance, created the Baloch problem, so to speak, inside Pakistan. It was a problem which existed. And then uh, because... They took advantage of it, yes. They took advantage of it. Just the way Pakistan takes advantage of certain issues inside yeah. India. When the opportunity arises, it's normal to do so. Uh, but you know, you don't want to have that sort of unhappiness and displeasure spread to the entire country. It would become very, very difficult to govern. Which is why you know one could say that the path the Pakistani military is on right now is quite dangerous for wow. the future stability of Pakistan. Hmm. Hmm. Where, where I'd love this phrase, uh, Balochistai, Balochistanization of Pakistan, and, and really that t says it all, what, what happened in this region, the killings, the massacres, the enforced disappearances, literally close to semi-genocide and uh, disappearances. It, it's been a terrible, terrible toll on the emotional body politic, not just of Balochistan, but Pakistan. Dr. Bangish, what did you make of Marang Baloch's to, you know, triumphant return to Lodzistan. You know, we need to look at it uh, as to what happened prior to that. Uh, she had brought these hundreds of Baloch uh, young women, young men, mothers, the elderly, and they had camped outside the uh, Islamabad press club starting from December the 20th. And they had a very, very simple demand. They said that we want the government to provide us information about our uh, missing loved ones. I mean, there are people that have disappeared for, for decades. Nobody knows about them. And they also mentioned when they were, of course, confronted by the media that these people are terrorists, etc. So she pointed out to them, she said, look, if they are terrorists, please charge them with the crime. 
put them on trial in a court of law and let the courts decide whether they are innocent or guilty. You can't make the people disappear and then say, well, these are terrorists. I mean, you know, who decides that? You see, unfortunately, uh, the people of Balochistan have suffered right from the beginning. Uh, in fact, you know, back uh, even when Pakistan came into existence, even at that time, the Baloch were actually, they wanted to maintain an independent state, the, the Khan of Kalata, for instance, you know. And then, of course, they had a uh, discussion with the government of Pakistan at the time. And uh, one of the uh, Khan of Kalat's brother had actually, uh, he was not in favor of that. So he went into the mountains. I think his name was Norez Khan or whatever. And they then ultimately the Pakistan army and the government made a deal with him and said, okay, uh, you, you can come down and we'll sort of sort this out through discussion. So when Norez Khan came, came down along with his, you know, family members, sons, etc., and other people, the Pakistan army actually uh, hanged two of his sons. And they said that these people have committed treason. And here, here is this is the background in which the people of Balochistan have existed right from the beginning. And then, of course, from 1973 to 76, when Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was the prime minister, he launched a military operation there. And over the last, you know, several decades, uh, you know, the Baloch have been terrorized, victimized, as as we know that you know there are thousands of people that have simply disappeared. And, and, you know, then you, even people that are kidnapped and then, you know, a few years later, their bullet riddled bo bodies are brought out. So when we look at all of this and you see that, you know, uh, Mehrang Baloch, when she returned to uh, Balochistan after they, they ended their sit-in uh, last Monday, uh, naturally the people of Balochistan uh, were, uh, you know, in support of her effort. And they, they said that, you know, obviously she had highlighted the plight of the Baloch people, so even though question. unfortunately, even though unfortunately yes, the government yes, and, and the media were completely hostile towards them. I mean, this is extremely sad yes. and depressing that people come and they are protesting peacefully and you unleash your, your police against them. You throw cold water on them in this bitter cold winter. You mm -hmm. beat them up and you put them in prison. And all they are saying is that, you know, we are Pakistani citizens. Please let us know what's happened to our loved ones. So this is unfortunately the situation that the Pakistan army deliberately creates. They, 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 you see, the thing is that, you know, as a quick question here, sir, quick question. Do you think this has the potential of morphing into a full scale, bloody, not just low level insurgency, but a high level insurgency in with not just people in Balochistan, but, you know, we could have copycat. Uh, type uh, uh, things happening in KP and maybe in Punjab. That's really the question. Do you think this this is may, may happen? There is a potential danger because the Pakistan army does not have a very you know good record in terms of how uh, it treated the people of KP uh, at, at at American behest. So from starting from 2002 to 2000. And, 15, 16, whatever. I mean, there were massive attacks on various parts of KP in the, you know, tribal belt, etc. Uh, drones were used against them. Americans were given a free hand to kill Pakistanis. So, over so you do think that there is a potential of an, uh, a mass scale insurgency in Balochistan and KP as a consequence of what we've seen in Maran? Well, you see, the thing is that um, I'm not sure whether there is going to be a full-scale insurgency, but I mm. think in, in Balochistan, there is a, a deep sense of frustration, yes, dissatisfaction yes. among the yeah. people. You see, it's a, it's a sparsely populated uh, you know, province, and uh, but I do fear that I think uh, India is going to exploit these grievances of the yeah. people in Balochistan. You. you will not be able to do so in, in KP because I, I, I'm from there. I know the people's you know a mental outlook. So, so again, like Murtaza said earlier, that this is a potential uh, time bomb ticking and your enemies will take advantage of it. Can I go to Murtaza? Murtaza, do you think this has the potential of, of uh, becoming a full-scale insurgency in Pakistan? Well, you know, people have been predicting uh, the demise of Pakistan for a very long time, usually with pretty good reason in the sense mm. that it faces many great threats, but the state somehow is still quite resilient. Uh, I think that 
You know, it's, I think the, the most concerning thing right now is the breakup on the national level and the loss of trust and loss of support among the people who are the usually the core constituencies of the state and the military. Obviously, minorities and people in the peripheral provinces have been upset for quite some time, feeling like they're getting the short end of the stick. But when you're losing your main constituencies as well, too, in Punjab and elsewhere, it's very troubling and, and worrisome for any country. Uh, I think that, yes, the instability is likely to rise. You could see the growth of ungoverned spaces in Pakistan, potentially. At the same time, the Pakistani military is very powerful, has a monopoly on force, has very, very well armed, a huge lion's share of the budget. It can impose order on a country, even when much of the population is not unhappy, is unhappy with the current regime. And you can see that in Iran, too. The, a lot of people in Iran are not happy with the government, but the government has a monopoly on force, so people just have to resign themselves to it. It could be the same in Pakistan, but the caveat in Pakistan is a much poorer country, so it doesn't really have the resources to buy people's acquiescence. It doesn't have oil or money or anything like that. It has a much larger population. You like the Middle East, yes. Yeah, you can't coax people to satisfaction you know, using your resources. So I think, unfortunately, what we've seen now is that military and strategic power are downstream of economic power. Mm. And if you look at India, for a long time, Pakistan was able to keep up with India on military spending and strategic uh, maneuvering to maintain some sense of parity or at least deterrence with India. But now India's economy is growing very, very big. And we have not seen the military or strategic manifestations of that yet, but you will see it in about 10 or 15 years. You're already seeing plans for India for significant arms sales, ramping up of their intelligence and military capacity, which they're going to deploy against Pakistan. Most of it's already actually not deployed against China support, you know, against Pakistan to date. And you're going to see more then. If Pakistan is a position where its economy is still stagnant, people are very unhappy for various reasons. And its biggest rival and enemy, which cannot, you know, for many deep reasons, cannot solve its uh, problems, grows and starts deploying its economic resources to a military capacity. You can use that to cause the breakup of Pakistan. It could start arming insurgencies. Wow. In Pakistan. Wow. Wow. It could start leveling the playing field between, you know, insurgent groups which are much weaker than the Pakistani government and giving them more capacity to cause a problem. Mm. So I think, absent a significant course change very soon, as soon as possible, you're going to see those threats. And I don't necessarily mean it would be the end of Pakistan because Pakistan has defied those sort of predictions many times before. But it could be a very, very significant threat to stability of the state, which uh, you know is increasingly in question uh, the more this crisis goes on. Thank you. Uh, sir, last quick comment, 30 seconds, before we move on to the, uh, the International Court of Justice. Well, I think, you know, what we have to uh, see is uh, how the elections uh, take place on February the 8th and how much manipulation, uh, social and, and political engineering takes place. That's the, that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, definitely the social contract in Pakistan has completely broken down. There is total lack of trust. The people do not trust any of their institutions because they're not delivering anything to them. So that is a very, very sad situation. And of course, you know, the economy is in tailspin. Whichever government comes to power, they will not be able to, uh, you know, stabilize the economy if there is political instability. And I think political instability, unfortunately, is going to continue because of the manipulation of elections that are about to occur in Pakistan. Thank you, Dr. Bagesh. Uh, I'm moving on to the International Court of Justice uh, ruling against uh, Israeli genocide. Uh, uh, Mutz, uh, I am constrained to share this uh, tweet that you had. you've taken a huge dig at the Canadian uh, media, and I'm glad you did. And you write that the global Globe and Mail is particularly insane, I think it's their commentary on the uh, judgment. They just decided to do a random front page story about how South Africa sucks on the day of the ICJ verdict, which they instead mentioned as a footnote, the Canadian media should be liquidated and the resources donated to charity, I and I will add to intercept. So very interesting. Uh, so your take on this, uh, on the on the ICJ judgment, please. Yeah, you know, I made that comics actually, uh, well, originally I grew up in Toronto and I remember how terrible the media was and still is today. So, you know, it's a very, 
controlled and uh, corrupt sense, you know, I guess I would say uh, amateurish uh, media environment, even the major news organizations in Canada, which is reflecting now in a very unserious coverage of the subject. I'm not saying that they have to take a side one way or another, but you can cover the subject fairly or at least responsibly, which they seem to have abdicated uh, that responsibility. So that's kind of why I made that comment. Uh, and you know, it's not sustainable the Canadian media environment relies on Canadian government subsidies, so that there's that as well too. Hmm. Um, the verdict is very, you know, interesting and important. I think you know some people. I think generally speaking, it was very, very unfavorable in many ways to Israel. Uh, it did not go to the extent of demanding an immediate ceasefire and provisional uh, as a provisional ruling. But yet, it said that uh, it views the charge of genocide as worthy of consideration, which means there'll probably be a very long, years-long process now of investigating whether Israeli officials committed genocide in Gaza. And, you know, I wrote something about this on Substack recently. I think it's important to note that in a colloquial way, people tend to think genocide means trying to kill every member of a specific group. Uh, the legal definition of genocide is not necessarily that. It could also mean trying to destroy the basis of life of a group of people, uh, you know, eliminate them as a people, even if not killing all of them, eliminating the basis of their culture or their livelihoods permanently or for an indefinite amount of time. That could also count as genocide, as defined by the Genocide Convention. Uh, so I think that there is a very strong case that Israel have done that in Gaza. They made Gaza, North Gaza, so far unlivable, maybe for a very long time, maybe forever it will not be livable for people or Palestinians going forward. They certainly seem to have intended that, and their statements seem to indicate that as well, too. So, you know, I think that there is a very significant chance that they will be found guilty of this charge going forward, and that could have very grave consequences. It could result in... UN member states getting together outside Security Council where the U.S. has a veto and would likely use it to defend Israel. To pass resolutions, uh, you know, they could be de-recognition of Israeli passports, shuttering of Israeli consulates, uh, criminal charges, op criminal cases open domestically in many, many countries around the world. Genocide crimes has universal jurisdiction. So if there was, they were found guilty in one country, they could be at risk for extradition. They may not be able to travel anymore. Similar to the way Vladimir Putin in the ICC, which is a separate court, he doesn't really seem to travel much anymore. Ever since mm. Had this warrant put out on him there. You know, Israeli officials could be treated like that. And it'll take some years to get to that point. But certainly this case will be a significant headache for them. And you can see in their own statements and conduct that they seem to be worried about this and seem to be shifting at least their messaging uh, to avoid further incriminating themselves in this case, which would have significantly negative consequences, as I said, if they were found guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Mozart. It's, it's, uh, you, you see a, a potentially a serious, serious uh, unfolding of uh, actions and activities against Israel and its people and its government functioning. Dr. Bagis, sir. Well, I see the ICJ uh, ruling as a sort of mixed bag. Um, you know, I think it definitely would have been uh, extremely important if it had called for an immediate ceasefire. I see on the one hand, it says that, you know, the South African case has merit and they will consider it the charge of genocide against Israel. And on the other hand, it sort of, you know, asks Israel to take steps to uh, prevent genocide and to not allow people to make uh, statements to incite genocide. And then he said, you report back to us in a month's time. That means, to, as far as the, the Zionists are concerned, the ICJ has told them, okay, you can continue with the slaughter for another month. And then you come back and tell us, uh, you know, what you have done with respect to that. Even yeah, in, in terms of the, the relief convoys that are being sent to Gaza, they are from the Egyptian side, from the Rafah crossing. There are literally hundreds of trucks that are stranded over there. They are not being allowed to uh, to enter. And even if they are allowed, the, the process that they, they implement is they unload all the goods and they want to make sure that there is nothing that the Israelis object to. So what kind of things the Israelis object to? They are not allowing, uh, you know, uh, women's hygiene products. 
They're not mm. allowing anesthesia, which, you know, there are more than 1,100 children whose legs had to be amputated without anesthesia. They're not uh, allowing uh, sa other sanitation products. So if, let's say, a particular truck has these, uh, you know, these items on them, they're, of course, now loaded back onto the truck and the truck has to go right to the back of the, the, the line again. And so Israel is still controlling uh, any goods from entering. I mean, the UN has said that, you know, uh, something like um, 850,000 Palestinians are on the verge of famine. Uh, only 16 of uh, Gaza's uh, 36 hospitals are only partially working. Mm. And the people are still being killed. I mean, the day that, you know, the ICJ verdict came, which was on Friday, the same day Israel killed 180 people in Gaza. So, you know, you can see that the Israelis don't give a damn about what the ICJ say, so long as they have the support of the United States and the rest of the Western countries, including Canada. I mean, the Canadian you know, response to this was absolutely pathetic. You know, on the one hand, they said that, you know, what the Canadian official statement was that, uh, you know, ICJ has not given its final ruling, so we'll wait for that. And, but they said that, you know, while we support the ICJ, um, we do not support necessarily support the process under which this has taken place. You know, this is such a cop out. I mean, you know, there was a time when Canada used to stand up for something. Today, it stands for nothing. This is particularly this particular government. But unfortunately, the, the opposition party, the conservatives are even worse. They are even more racist and bigots. And mm -hmm. so basically what has happened is that North America as a whole and Europe are all on the side of the Zionists. And I'll tell you why that is the case, because they see Israel or the Israelis as their own kith and kin. The overwhelming majority of the Israelis are not indigenous to that land. They are colonial settlers from Europe, East and West, North America, just like the Europeans came and settled North America and they perpetrated a genocide against the native populations 200 years ago. That's precisely what Israel is doing. And naturally, these people will support it. Is there is there some hope, as Murtaza said, in this judgment and this, then the years long investigation into genocide, that this may actually turn out into something good, wonderful, the delegitimization, the derecognition of Israel, the restriction on them, on their travel, they're being arrested, treated like war criminals, and perhaps leading to a one state solution. Do you think so? Well, I think th there is definitely, I mean, you know, I, I don't wish to say that there is nothing positive coming out of this. I mean, th there's a distinct possibility uh, that, you know, the Israeli rulers perhaps would be uh, barred from traveling for fear of being arrested and, you know, etc. And if uh, ultimately the ICJ actually finds Israel guilty of genocide, mm. then, of course, you know, ICJ only rules in terms of states. Right. Uh, then it would open the possibility, uh, just like it happened in the case of Bosnia, that these people then could be tried at the International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. And th that happened in Bosnia, you know, Milosevic, yep. Karadic, yep. and, you know, yep. Mladic, etc. They were brought before the court and convicted. Of course, uh, uh, Milosevic died in the while yes. during the trial, but the other two uh, have been convicted. So there is that possibility. What really I think would be important is to see the countries around Israel, particularly the Arab countries, if they were to muster some courage and say to hell with you, Israel, we are not going to normalize relations with you. We'll stop trade. We will not supply you, you know, oil. We're not going to allow your planes to fly over our territories. But unfortunately, they're not doing that. They're still continuing their, their business as, 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 as if it's business as usual. I also want right. to add this other point. Turkey despite the fine rhetoric of Erdogan, hmm. Turkey's trade with Israel between November and December increased by 34.8%. Hmm. I mean, that's outrageous for hmm. Turkey to do that. Hmm. At the time when it's saying, well, you know, 
So they took advantage of of this war and really upped their trade. So uh, we're kind of winding down to the to the hour, and I know Mutsa has to go and so if you so just a small last uh, thing about uh, and, and you know maybe we don't want to discuss that in a lot of detail, but there's this report by George Mason University in the U.S. in which it says that information manipulation campaigns have been launched against Muslims and NGOs and charities, and they've actually actually named uh, some um, people who were part of this uh, disinformation campaign. One is Hussein Haqqani, you know, former Pakistani ambassador, uh, you know, who now works for the Hudson Institute. M. Zudi Jasser of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. Uh, Jonathan Shanzer of the Foundation for Defense of Democracy. Then Sarah Stern of the Endowment for Middle East Truth acted as this is an interesting word, legitimators on Capitol Hill. So with you first, Dr. Bangish, and then to Murza, and then we close. Thank you. Well, you see, uh, Hussein Haqqani is a, is a turncoat. He has always done these dirty tricks and working for the Hudson Institute, it's an extremely right-wing institute. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm not surprised. Also, if you, if you see the, the last two individuals, they are Zionists. Mm -hmm. They are working for these, uh, you know, Zionist, uh, uh, pro-Zionist sort of, you know, uh, entities. So I'm not surprised that they are doing this. But I think we need to go back a little bit. Uh, in fact, as far back as 2003, uh, Cheryl Bernard, who is the wife of uh, Zalmay Khalil Zad, uh, a, a neocon, Cheryl Bernard actually had written a paper for Rand Corporation in which she actually said for the U.S. how it should deal with the Muslims. So, like, you know, they said that there are uh, Muslim extremists or terrorists and there are fundamentalist Muslims. So he actually laid out uh, four categories of Muslims. And and the last category, of course, was these moderate Muslims who will promote American policy and the U.S. government and other Western governments should be promoting these people. And that's you, you see that is manifesting itself today in, in what Haqqani is doing. And there are unfortunately other perhaps this. I don't know who this fellow uh, Zuhi Jasser is, but he's probably part of the same thing. And there are also people in England that are being promoted who said that they were formerly Muslims and then they broke away and then they became because it's all a money game. If you pay them, you know, they are dogs, they'll, they'll bark for you. And so that's unfortunately what these people are doing. Uh, yes, uh, Murtza. Yeah, you know, it's uh, basically for a long time, I'd say since even before 9-11, there was quite a, mm, I guess you could say an opportunity for people to play this role to kind of foment the uh, demonization or delegitimization of any political activism, financial fundraising, and the general political presence in the United States of any Muslim organizations. And, you know, unfortunately, these, you know, generally neoconservative leaning organizations, many of which are created formally for lobbying for the security interests of Israel, uh, they've played a leading role in helping foment this. And after 9-11, because of the impetus that created, it gave them the opportunity to launch some very significant and severe crackdowns, which led people going to jail, shutting down of major Muslim charities in the United States and so forth. So, you know, these kind of activities can be quite pernicious and effective. And I think today there's still a lot of suspicion, hostility towards Muslim organizations in the United States. And a lot of it is generated at the elite level in D.C. And, you know, you can, it can be very politically can be convenient for people to play that role. And I think it's very interesting to see Hussein Akhani's name mentioned in this, because obviously in the context of Pakistan, the Pakistan diaspora is quite a famous and polarizing figure. And, you know, to see his name mentioned in the sort of activities, you know, doesn't really paint him in a particularly flattering light, you could say. So it's fascinating, uh, this report. It's not necessarily much that I haven't seen before. Uh, I'm still going through the, the ending of it. But, uh, you know, it certainly fits a broader theme we've seen of uh, attacks against Muslim Americans in civil society, uh, which are organized by these sort of shadowy uh, and, you know, kind of well-resourced organizations, individuals based in D.C. 
Thank you very much, uh, Murza. Thank you very much, Dr. Zafar Bagh. It's a wonderful discussion today on uh, starting from Pakistan and the uh, intemperate uh, um, uh, commentary by the Pakistan Army Chiefs against Afghanistan and that we touched on the possibility of a Balochistanization of Pakistan and what's happening in Balochistan. And then we touched on, on of course, the ICG and a really, really uh, interesting perspectives uh, from Dr. Bangish yourself and, and what's that finally on this uh, massive disinformation campaign against Muslim uh, society in North America. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining. Hope to see you soon, inshallah, uh, next week or, or maybe perhaps earlier or later. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and all your love ones and may everyone be safe and sound pakistan zindabad pakistan paidabad only pray for a peaceful world thank you very much